Hi, this video is on what is called the problem of evil. It's part of a series of philosophy lecture videos I've been doing, uh, presenting philosophy from one Christian uh, perspective, namely mine. I do engage some other uh, perspectives or, or variations as well. But the problem of evil is probably the, the biggest um, question with regard to Christian, Christian thinking from a philosophical standpoint. And the basic idea is, is that if God is good, why doesn't he stop evil? Um, and we believe that God is good. I mean, fundamental to Christian faith is the belief that God is love. And if that means anything, then love needs to be defined in an ordinary way. I mean, if I say, um, I love you, and in my world, love means I can slap you anytime I want to. I mean, that's not what love is. Love has a certain definition, uh, meaning the good, wanting the good of others. And so you can't, you can't just take a word and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define love as shooting people randomly. You know, it doesn't work that way. And so the Bible says that God is love, and the word love meant positive things at the time. And so we have to ask, how can a God who is love allow people to drown, allow volcanoes to uh, you know, erupt on people, um, and things like that? Why, why does a good God let those things happen? That's the problem of evil. By the way, this problem was recognized um, long before... Um, uh, Jesus came to earth. Uh, of course, the book of Job in the Old Testament uh, is um, wrestles a little bit with this, um, and God's answer at the end of Job seems to be, sorry, it's above your pay grade. <laughs> in so many words, um, this is not something that you can necessarily understand, Job. Um, and Epicurus was a Greek around the year 300 BC, and he also wrestled with this. Here was Epicurus's formulation, probably uh, one of the early formulations of this question. Are the gods willing to prevent evil but not able? Then they're impotent. Uh, in other words, um, maybe I want to keep you from suffering, uh, but if I can't keep you from suffering, that, that means I'm not, I, I obviously lack in power. The problem here is, of course, that um, Christians believe that God is all-powerful, so uh, uh, that doesn't work. Um, of course, he's talking about Zeus and Aphrodite and Hermes and, and the Greek gods. Are they able but not willing? Then they're malevolent. That, that suggests that they're evil. You know, they enjoy watching us suffer. Are they both able and willing to stop evil? Then why is there evil? This was his question. Of course, Epicurus's own answer was is that the gods were off in such blissful peace uh, uh, in their own time, in their own place, that they don't even notice what's going on down here uh, on earth. That's kind of his uh, solution to the to the problem. Well, uh, Arch Archibald MacLeish wrote a play called J.B., which is actually modeled on Job, and the main character, J.B., puts the problem like this. If God is God, he is not good. If God is good, he is not God. Uh, in other words, if God is God, all-powerful, he must not be good because he lets evil happen. If God is good, he must not be God, he must not be all-powerful, because then surely he would stop evil. So here's the, here's, the, here's the problem. We as Christians believe that God is all-powerful, and yet we as Christians believe that God is all-good and all-loving, then why is there evil? And that is the question of evil or the so-called problem of evil. And it's, it's something that Christians have wrestled with uh, forever. Um, an answer to this, well, so a suggested answer to the problem of evil is called a theodicy. A theodicy is an explanation of how God can be just and good in the light of the existence of suffering and evil. Okay, so we've got the problem or the question. Uh, you know, because I believe in God, I don't think it's really a problem. I think it's a problem for us because we don't understand, but I'll go ahead and, and call it a problem because that's what people have called it, problem of evil. I, I do want to clarify. I think this is important. What actually is evil? Dr. Evil, you know, what, what is evil? Um, we talk about evil as if it's a thing, as if it's a substance. I don't know if you've ever seen an old movie called uh, Time Bandits, uh, where they finally, you know, they, 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 or, evil was actually a little black piece of coal, I mean, as, it, as it turns out. It's, a, it's, a, it's stuff. It's a thing. Um, if evil is a thing, 
then God created it because God created everything. And so this is something, of course, that Nietzsche uh, says. I'm, I, I might, might have been in the preface of Beyond Good and Evil. I can't remember exactly where he says it. But Nietzsche basically says, when I was a boy, I realized that if we were going to give God the credit for good, then we had to give God the credit for evil too. Ha ha. Um, uh, there are no haha in, in German, but uh, in the German text of Nietzsche. But basically, um, this does seem to be a coherent argument that if evil is a little black piece of coal, um, then we would, if evil is a thing, a presence, then we would have to say that God created evil. And this is a, this becomes a little bit problematic. How could God, a good God, create evil? Um, but I don't think this is actually. A, a good way of thinking of what evil is. So um, sometimes Christians talk about a sinful nature. A sinful nature is not uh, scalpel. Oh, I see it right there next to the uh, the uvula. You know, or uh, there it is. It's in the spleen. Let's go in. We're gonna. Oh, okay. Tink. Okay, we've taken the sinful nature out. Um, so the sinful nature is not a thing, and evil is not a thing. Um, it's not a substance. It's not a stuff. Uh, if it was, then we would have to say that God created it. Uh, of course, there are uh, there are religions that that view evil as a thing. Zoroastrianism, for example, which was a Persian religion, I think there's still traces of it today in Iran. Um, Zoroastrianism believed in two gods, a good one and a bad one, uh, and so you had um, uh, Ahura Mazda, the good god, and Ahriman, the evil god, um, and they were almost co-powerful. Um, in Zoroastrian thought. But that's not what Christians believe. Christians don't believe that evil is a thing. Now, of course, there are others who have suggested that evil is an absence, or, or maybe, actually, Augustine, uh, I think, talks about e evil as a twisted, as, as good twisted. Um, and so you might talk about evil as the absence of a thing. Uh, this is, I think, a better way of conceptualizing, for example, for those of, I'm in the Methodist tradition, the Wesleyan tradition, we talk about entire sanctification, something like that, where God can can take all of you, what John Wesley talked about, Christian perfection and things like that. And I think uh, far more helpful than, than talking about God surgically removing your sinful nature, that it's much more helpful to think of it in terms that uh, a, a woman theologian by the name of Mildred uh, Bangs Winecoop thought of it, it's that, that what, what is our problem is a lack of power. Uh, it's not the presence of an evil force, but rather the absence of the Holy Spirit, that without God's power within us, you know, the system's just not going to work right because we lack the power. In that sense, receiving the Holy Spirit is like plugging in, you know, to where we actually have the power to do the good, um, not in our own power, but by God's, uh, by God's power and by God's energy, uh, and so that's again that's a that's better. We're getting at a better model uh, of what evil is. Then, then we don't say that God created evil, but we say that God created the possibility or the potentiality for evil uh, in this world. He did not actually make. And now I'm going to make black coal, you know, and it's going to be evil. But that that He created a world in which it was possible. Uh, for evil. So the, the Neoplatonists and so forth uh, talked about uh, evil as a privation of the good, um, the absence of the good, and in the absence of the good, bad things, you know, are going to happen. Now, actually, I think both, uh, now, uh, by the way, uh, uh, we can think of how did, how did Adam sin if Adam didn't have a sin nature, or if, uh, and Jesus, how could Jesus be tempted if Jesus didn't have a sin nature? Um, I think some of this helps with that as well, because um, temptation comes from, or can come from, temptation can come from a good, a good desire that is uh, targeting a inappropriate object. So Adam is, you know, Satan, what does Satan say to Eve? Um, you'll get knowledge if you eat from this tree. Well, the desire for knowledge is a good desire. The desire to be all you can be, you know, to excel, to to um, uh, to reach new heights. Um, that's a good drive. And so there's a good drive, but it's given an inappropriate object. 
a, a tree of, of good and evil uh, that um, Adam and Eve were told not to eat from. So you can see where a person without a sin nature can be tempted because a good drive can can be uh, focus, can be brought into focus on an inappropriate object. Same thing, for example, with regard to sex. Sex in and of itself is a good, but sec the sexual drive can be uh, can find an inappropriate object. And so, say let's let's talk about Jesus. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about Jesus' uh, sexual te temptations, as far as I can remember. But you know, I, if he was tempted in every way as we are, uh, then it makes sense to suggest that at some point in his life, Jesus had sexual temptations. So, how can that be when he doesn't have a sin nature? Well, sex sexual drive is good. Um, when a sexual drive has an inappropriate object, that's when we are tempted. And so uh, this is also in James 1. James indicates that temptation is not sin, but it's when it has conceived uh, that it gives birth to sin. So the, the, the goal as Christians is for us not to let temptation conceive and give birth uh, to sin. So I, I think that, that thinking of, of uh, evil as an absence gets us a little bit further. However, in the end, uh, I would suggest that um, um, what I've been saying about temptation fits best. If we think of evil as an adjective, that is, evil describes a certain kind of intention, um, that it's not a, either a thing or the absence of a thing, uh, although the absence of God's power is going to result in us sinning, for sure. Um, but that, that in terms of, of defining evil, um, I would define evil as basically something is evil if it manifests an intent to, to do harm to others or uh, to defy God. And that basically this is what evil is. Evil is an adjective that describes uh, a person's intent. A person can have good intentions. A person can have neutral intentions. A person can have bad intentions. And something is evil if it involves an intention on the part of a human uh, to either do harm to others, uh, to wrong others, or to defy God. So basically we defy sin and evil in relation to um, the love command, love God, love neighbor. That's the, the all ethics, all, all human ethics, as we'll talk about later when we get to the ethics video, all ethics is summarized in love God, love neighbor. And therefore, all sin and evil is defined as the negative. Uh, sin is that which is not loving toward God and that which is not loving uh, toward neighbor uh, or self. So um, I got a little ahead of myself, uh, or at least probably should have reformulated the, the PowerPoint. Let me go up here and make this important distinction. And when we think of, of evil in terms of intent, then only a being can do something evil. Evil only applies to the realm of intentionality. Therefore, moral evil has to do with evil intent uh, by way of either a human being or a uh, supernatural being, a, a demon, a Satan, angel, God, that, uh, of course, God cannot think evil thoughts. None of the angels think evil thoughts. But evil is a matter of sentience. Evil is a matter of consciousness. Uh, a plant cannot do something that's evil. A rock cannot do something that's evil. A volcano cannot do something that's evil. A tornado cannot do something that's evil because they don't think. That evil is purely a matter of intentionality and consciousness. Now, so when we talk about natural uh, suffering or things like that, when we talk about cancer, when we talk about you know tornadoes, or when we talk about flooding or, or drowning, uh, when we talk about these sorts of things, we're talking about suffering, but we're not talking about evil. Where, 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 it gets, where the, pro the problem of evil comes into, the, into play when we talk about God, and we ask, why didn't God stop that from happening? Because then we're talking about consciousness, and then we're talking about intentionality. But the act itself of a tree falling on you, that's suffering, but it's not evil. And in my, in my opinion, that's an important distinction uh, that we need to make. Okay, now that we've got our definitions out there, let me uh, talk about the two main theodicies or the two main explanations for why 
uh, there is suffering in the world and, or, and evil in the world and why God allows it. The first one is named after Irenaeus, who lived in the late 100s AD. So he's a Christian. Um, and he proposed what, what is sometimes called the soul-making theodicy. And this is kind of the jungle gym view of the world. Namely, God has created a world where human agents have an environment that is appropriate for spiritual growth. So I, I thank the Lord I've never been bedridden for a long period of time. But I understand that if you, if you are confined to a bed for very long at all, your muscles very quickly begin to atrophy. That is to say that without resistance, without challenge, uh, then we become flabby. Um, we become, we, we, we are, uh, what was that movie? Uh, it was a cartoon movie, uh, animated film, where they were uh, riding around space, waiting for the earth to, um, to kind of heal itself. Was it Wally? I can't remember. But everybody's just hugely obese, and they just lie around all the time. Um, so a world in which there are challenges, a world in which we have to climb steps, is a world in which we become healthier. And you could argue that this is the way that God has made the world. Uh, this is an argument, for example, um, again, I'm, I, we'll talk about uh, socialism in a later video, but uh, a world in which everybody simply has everything provided for them is not a world, arguably, that makes for maximal humanity. That God has not created a world where everything comes easy, and that actually having a challenge, having resistance, I mean, uh, a, a circuit, uh, an electrical circuit, in which there is no resistance will immediately burn up the, the, the battery uh, and the, the power source. I've, 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 every once in a while while jumping a car, I've gotten the, um, the positive and the negative crossed, and immediately I know because of the spark that I've shorted out the circuit. It's not a good thing. And so you, you, resistance is an important element of an electrical circuit. And so Irenaeus is basically suggesting that God has a created world, created a world in which there is there are some weights that we have to lift here. You know, no pain, no gain, as the as the saying goes. Um, so we must reckon with the possibility. And and I I personally, I personally am not able to have uh, what I think is anywhere near a complete answer to the question of suffering unless I reckon with the possibility that suffering can serve positive moral purposes, that suffering is not intrinsically uh, bad, that suffering can actually bring about uh, good. Now, this is not a pleasant thing to say, but um, if you know, um, the alternative isn't, that, isn't, isn't better. Uh, that is to say, someone who says, well, the problem of evil shows that believing in God is just crazy. You know, somebody who says that has to reckon with the fact, as Dostoevsky said, that, that if there is no God, then everything is permissible. That is to say, if there is no God, then there's no such thing as evil at all. If there is no God, then murdering someone is not evil. It's just unfortunate for the person who gets murdered. You see what I'm saying? The alternative to there being a good God is not a better world. Um, so so I, I, I think we, we probably, I'm not omniscient by any means. I'm not the smartest man in the world, but it seems to me that we must reckon with the possibility that suffering in and of itself is not evil, um, but that there can be many good things that can come uh, from, from suffering. We may have to hit a, a slight reset button. Uh, no matter how we cut it, uh, it's possible, possible that we may have to uh, rethink uh, that, that aspect of human existence. Of course, C.S. Lewis is known, this is a famous quote from C.S. Lewis, Pain insists upon being attended to. We can't ignore pain. God, he whispers to us in our, our pleasures. Um, he speaks to us in our conscience, but God shouts to us in our pains. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Well, I know there are people who find this to be uh, rather callous, and certainly you don't want to, uh, by the way, you don't want to necessarily give arguments of this sort to somebody who's in grief. Um, when, when you're actually trying to comfort someone, that's not the time for rational argument. Well, you realize, of course, that uh, C.S. Lewis said, not the time. Don't do it. Um, basically, if somebody's suffering, you just need to be there for them. You know, even if they're saying, why did God allow this? Probably not the time to start giving philosophical answers. That's a misread, 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 you know, beep, beep, beep. 
keep reversing, you know, so, so we can have these discussions in a philosophy class or when we're not actually, you know, suffering. Um, probably, uh, if you bring up this quote in the middle of suffering, probably not a good time. Um, and of course, Shadowlands talks about uh, C.S. Lewis's own wrestling with his wife's uh, death. Uh, and, uh, you know, th these arguments weren't so helpful for him, uh, from what I can, can tell, when he was actually suffering himself. So anyway, that's the Irenaean uh, theodicy. The other theodicy, which is a little bit more robust, uh, is the Augustinian theodicy. This comes from Augustine, who lived, you know, around 400 AD, AD 400. Uh, the Augustinian theodicy focuses on Adam. And we might call this the free will theodicy. The idea here, and you, you've probably heard this, this, this to me is one of the best uh, arguments. I'm not sure it, it's completely satisfying, but it, it is one of the most satisfying arguments. And it, we might put it like this. Now, this is not, I'll give you Augustine's form here in a second. But it's basically that a world in which we are able to choose between the good or the evil, a, a, a world in which we are free moral agents is a better world in, than a world in which we are robots who can't help but do the good. That, that God has created a world where we have moral choice, and that's good. The problem is that a world in which we have moral choice means that some people are going to make a bad choice, and so there's going to be evil because God has created a world in which we have free will. Now, of course, Augustine didn't believe that we have free will now. Uh, so let me give you Augustine's version of it. Uh, Augustine believed that Adam, the first human, had free will. So moral evil exists because God gave Adam free will. Uh, it was passe non peccare. It was possible for Adam not to sin. So Adam had a free will choice as to whether he would sin or not. Now, unfortunately for us, Adam chose poorly, uh, and so now we cannot help but sin. Now it is non passe, non peccare. It is not possible not uh, to sin. And so uh, uh, the way in which Augustine's version of this is different than the one I told you a second ago is that Augustine would say that Adam was the one who had the free will choice, and that a world in which Adam, uh, as a representative of humanity, had a free will choice, that that world's a better world than one in which Adam didn't have any free will choice. But uh, believe me, Augustine does, did not believe that you and I have a free will choice. Augustine is the father of predestination as it is modernly conceived, uh, you know, in John Calvin and such. And so um, humanity now uh, does not have the choice uh, according to Augustine or, or Calvin. Okay, let me throw in here Gottfried Leibniz uh, from around, I think, uh, 16, 1700s. Um, Leibniz basically believed that this is the best of all possible worlds, that God actually created this, the way things are set up now, where we have moral choice, and I think Leibniz would have been more of the initial version of the, of the theodicy, of the free will theodicy. So Leibniz, um, uh, Leibniz would not uh, have uh, necessarily fully embraced Augustine, if I, if I remember correctly. I, I might be wrong on that. I need to double check it. It'll be too late for you because the video will be over by then. But let me give you this quote from, from Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz, I do not believe that a world without evil, which is preferable uh, uh, in, well, I do not believe that a world without evil is possible, nor preferable because otherwise God would have done it. Um, it would have been preferred to God. It is necessary to believe that the mixture of evil has produced the greatest possible good. Otherwise, evil would not have been permitted. Um, actually, this may not be, uh, this may not actually uh, be a free will argument, um, now, that I, now that I think of it. He's basically saying that God created a world in which there's evil uh, as the optimal kind of world. Now, of course, I don't, agree with Leibniz. I think that God has the freedom uh, to create lots of different kinds of, uh, of worlds. Uh, but okay, well, evolution. Where does evolution uh, fit into uh, this whole thing? Uh, evolution throws a, a big kink into the Augustine um, uh, uh, perspective. Now, of course, by the way, I might, I might mention that, that um, from a Wesleyan Arminian perspective, um, we do have a kind of free will in this sense, that Wesleyans believe that by God's prevenient grace, 
God empowers everybody to decide whether to say more uh, to God for uh, more grace, more goodness. And so uh, even though Wesleyan Arminians agree with Augustine and agree with Calvin that the default state of humanity is now total depravity, that's, that's Orthodox Wesleyan belief. However, Wesleyans believe, uh, Calvinists believe that God either turns the switch on or on. Either God turns the switch on and we become good, or God leaves the switch off and we remain bad. West, for Wesleyans, it's more like a dimmer switch. God turns his grace up just enough for us to have just enough freedom to say more. And then the more we respond, more. And then, and then God you know, kind of boots us up uh, to, uh, to become uh, the, uh, righteous, uh, not, just, not just legally righteous in, in an imputed way, but in, in an imparted way. God actually makes us uh, good, good people not in ourselves, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's a sense in which the Wesleyan Arminian tradition believes that we have a sort of free will now, even though uh, Adam's sin happened. Uh, okay, let me, let me go back to the question of evolution. Evolution seems to throw a kink uh, into, the, uh, into this, uh, a wrench into this question, the Augustinian theodicy. So the Augustinian theodicy, theodicy is the best answer that I've ever seen for uh, the problem of evil. Um, but what about evolution? Because evolution suggests, one, that there was lots of death before Adam. Um, and in fact, some evolutionists would, would question whether there ever was an Adam. In fact, right now we have, um, we have uh, genetics has been the most recent uh, kind of uh, wrench in the machine. So it used to be, so 20 years ago when I started teaching, um, I knew some Christians who said um, they, they thought of Adam and Eve as the first human beings into which God put a soul. Uh, and so they could believe in the Adam and Eve story uh, and believe in evolution, but their idea was is that Adam and Eve were the first human beings into which God put a soul. Um, that perspective has uh, become more difficult uh, as the, the gen human genome has been mapped. Um, uh, and you may know Francis Collins, The Language of God. Francis Collins is a, a believer in God. He's a Christian. He's a theist. Um, yet he believes in evolution as well. Um, and yet, uh, he and others would say that the diversity of the human genetic pool um, is too diverse to have gone back to a single uh, man and woman. That is to say, um, genetically, the current state of, of, of genetics would say that um, you simply can't, they would say, you simply can't argue that human genes go back to a, a, a pair uh, a single pair of men and men and women, man and woman who lived at the same time, and so this has created um, a bit of a wrench to uh, people like my old uh, biology friend who, who believed that Adam was the first person into whom God put a soul. John Walton uh, at Wheaton uh, has suggested that perhaps Adam and Eve were king priests of a rather large group of humans, Homo sapiens, maybe about forty thousand. Um, humans, and that they uh, were the ones that made the choice as a representative uh, of that particular uh, group. Scott McKnight and um, um, uh, another gentleman uh, have written a book uh, called Adam and the, um, and the Genome, I believe it is, uh, in which they've explored uh, both the science and some of the, uh, the biblical texts on this. But I, I'm not sure that they answer the philosophical questions. Uh, that were in this that are in this video. In other words, they they talk about the biblical texts and they talk about the genetics, but they don't, in my opinion, really answer the the real crucial questions uh, that are theological questions and philosophical questions. So let me just quickly um, uh, engage some of the issues here. So there's there is of course the question of how to interpret Genesis one. And so there is, of course, the literal six-day, 24-hour interpretation of Genesis 1, which, which obviously would preclude any kind uh, of evolution. However, um, I think most Old Testament scholars would say that Genesis 1 is much more, of a, much more poetic in nature uh, than, um, uh, than historical in, in the sense of, this is, and now we have a, a Rick, we have the 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 real to real on this. Here's a picture of God doing it in 24 hours. So so it's it's not difficult in terms of the genre of Genesis one 
to, to take it as a somewhat um, uh, poetic presentation uh, of creation. So I, I don't actually think that Genesis 1, in the light of genre, is a particularly uh, difficult challenge to the question of evolution. Romans 5 is. Romans 5 is the, uh, the real uh, difficult passage when it comes to evolution. Why? Because Romans 5, in Romans 5, and in 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, Paul talks about death entering the world uh, through Adam. And now you could say, my, so my old biology friend used to say, uh, perhaps Paul is talking about spiritual death entering the world through Adam. And that's certainly true. But um, I, I really think that Paul's talking about more than spiritual death uh, in these passages. He, it sure seems, especially since 1 Corinthians 15 is about bodily resurrection, it sure seems like um, uh, Paul is talking about physical death also entering the world uh, through, uh, through Adam. And so even if you have John Walton's interpretation where Adam and Eve are representative homo sapiens, uh, there is this question of what to do uh, with Paul's text. Well, let me, let me just uh, sketch out uh, one answer that has been given. So one answer is uh, the tree of life interpretation uh, that can still take Adam and Eve as literal uh, beings who made a choice at a particular point and that they were making a choice for all of humanity as representatives, um, but reads the Genesis uh, 2 and 3 story in this way. And I'm not saying this is right, by the way. I'm just thinking through these issues with you. You'll have to You'll have to decide, and uh, the church will have to decide on these sorts of things. So, in the tree of life interpretation, Adam and Eve do not live because they do not partake of the tree of life. If you read the Genesis story, it sounds like it is partaking of the tree of life that gives them eternal life. In other words, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden, uh, God says, Let us banish them from the garden lest they eat from the tree of life and live forever. It sure sounds like they were already in a default mode of dying, that, that death was the default of the Garden of Eden, and that the only reason that they lived is because uh, the tree of life would have allowed them to, to live. But because the tree of life is not available to them, they do not get to live, and thus they do not live forever. So in, in that reading of Genesis 2 and 3, death is not evil in and of itself, but that, the, the, that death is a consequence of the fall because Adam and Eve did not have access uh, to the tree of life. And so death is a consequence uh, of the fall, um, but it is not the default. The default uh, was that all creatures uh, die. Again, I don't know what you think of that, uh, but that would be one possible way uh, of, uh, of trying to work around uh, what Paul says. Now, again, I'm, uh, uh, these are things the church needs to wrestle through in its ongoing debate about how science and Christianity relate to each other. Here's an interesting thought I had once upon a time, and that is this. Could there be other worlds uh, where the mix of fallenness is different? Uh, and so, for example, um, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a, uh, a fiction, a science fiction, in which there was a world that never fell. Uh, is it possible that there are other worlds uh, with, where God has beings with souls on them where they never fell? Is, here's another thought. Is it possible that there are other worlds where they fell, but they are not um, as much fallen as we are? What, what I mean by that is um, uh, Jesus says, uh, narrow is the way here and few there be that find it. In other words, it seems to be that on the earth, more people will not make it than make it. Is it possible that there are other fallen worlds out there where more people make it that, than don't make it? Um, this kind of plays against uh, Leibniz a bit, but it's the idea that there may, actually be, uh, there may actually be a net righteousness in the universe um, with only a few uh, places in the universe being more fallen uh, like we are. Again, I'm not in any way suggesting this is the case. It's more of a thought experiment, uh, which you expect in a philosophy lecture, right? Okay, in the end, I really like what Blaise Pascal says. 
uh, who lived, I believe, in the um, uh, 1700s. Pascal said, we can understand nothing of God's works unless we accept the principle that he wanted to blind some and enlighten others. God wishes to move the will rather than the mind. Perfect clarity would help the mind, uh, but harm the will. The way I interpret this is, is that God has made the universe susceptible to more than one interpretation. I, I think I've mentioned this before. If you have faith, it is possible to interpret the evidence in such a way as supporting the existence and love of God. But it's also ambiguous enough uh, that if you don't have faith, you can interpret the world as not being good and they're not being a God. And in this sense, the existence of suffering and so forth helps create this world in which we make uh, moral choices. The moral choices aren't entirely clear. And so God wishes to see where our heart is, um, not necessarily exactly where our head is. Pascal, of course, is known uh, for his wager. Pascal's wager was uh, some of his betting buddies. He basically said that, um, uh, you know, I would bet on God because if you bet uh, if you bet on God and he's not real, hey, you've lived a good life, you've helped the world, good. You know, but if you bet against God and he's real, then you have eternal punishment. Uh, and so in terms of, you know, how to bet, um, from a betting perspective, betting on God is the better better bet. And of course, we can imagine that Soren Kierkegaard is laughing at us uh, for even trying to explain these sorts of things. Kierkegaard would say, it's all blind faith, buddy. Um, well, he's kind of annoying to me. But okay, this has been the problem of evil. To me, the best explanation is, is that a world in which we have some freedom, either to choose the good or to choose the evil, that that's a better world than a world in which we're robots. But if there is that possibility of choosing evil, some people are going to choose it, and then we're going to have evil. And that contributes, of course, to suffering. Um, and of course, I don't think that all suffering is necessarily bad, uh, that it actually may be uh, helpful in terms of uh, uh, of driving us toward moral excellence and toward goodness. Well, some thoughts on the problem of evil.